Heavenly Father, we ask for your presence this morning as we uh, take up the worship service this Sabbath day. We ask that you'd fill this room with angels, that we might breathe the heavenly atmosphere, uh, that the light from on high might fill our souls. We ask that you would open our understanding to things that would edify us, strengthen us, and better prepare us to give a winning message to those that we come into contact with. And we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, if you have the handout, the one handout I'm, I'm not going to address today, I don't even remember the name of it, the King of the South or something, but I put that on a chat room here recently, and it pretty much summarizes some thoughts that need to be in place as we continue on through Daniel 11, 40 to 45, so you can take that up later if you haven't looked at it. I'm... This is following, I'm taking advantage of the superintendent's remarks to follow my last presentation, which is in response to what Larry was teaching about numbers and chronology. Um, I'll try to get beyond that today in the worship hour, but this is kind of pulling some of the thoughts that he and I have put in place here recently together, and even Daniel. But from Wikipedia, uh, a, and it's a, there were several you could pick from. The definition of numerology, because that's what people say that we're doing when we're looking at these numbers, is numerology is any belief in the divine or mystical relationship between a number and one or more coincidental events. It is also the study of the numerical value of the letters and words, names and ideas. It is often, often associated with the paranormal alongside astrology and similar divinatory arts. So what I'm saying is it's a counterfeit of a truth and you have two paragraphs here from three paragraphs here from Patriarchs and Prophets page 263-264. First paragraph Moses throws down his serpent his rod throws down his rod and it became a serpent you can see that in the first paragraph in the bold face um, and in the second paragraph, it says, It was the hand of God and no human influence or power possessed by Moses and Aaron that wrought the miracles which they showed before Pharaoh. So it wasn't magic. But in the third paragraph, the magicians come in and they counterfeit uh, this miracle of Moses. Um, and where it says he produced Satan's power to do so, he produced a counterfeit in that third paragraph. I'll read from there. It says, To human sight the rods were changed to serpents. Such they were believed to be by Pharaoh and his court. <clears throat> there was nothing in their appearance to distinguish them from the serpent produced by Moses, though the Lord caused the real serpent to swallow up the spurious ones. Yet even this was regarded by Pharaoh not as the work of God's power, but as a result of a kind of magic superior to that of his servants. So, <clears throat> to look at the work of Palmoni and identify it as satan satanic numerology is to place yourself in the category of Pharaoh. Okay, so, um, <coughs> not denying that numerology is a satanic magical art, but it's a counterfeit. There's bound to be a true, in fact, if there has to be a true in order for a counterfeit to exist, right? Mm -hmm. If there is no true, then there can't be a counterfeit. Okay, so in the next couple pages, I have snippets from Hiram Edson's seven articles uh, from 19, or 1856, and I don't have the page numbers marked for you because I took those seven articles, I put them into a paper, so th the pagination on the paper I wrote was different than Hiram Edson's articles so you can, you can access those articles, you can get them from me, you can get the paper I wrote. But I just wanted to pull some points out of his articles as we begin to look at some numbers. Um, and I've said this several times here recently, trying to emphasize this, and I don't know that everyone out there is following uh, this theme, but I hope that they would. From the fact of the important question under consideration being proposed at the close of the vision by the number of secrets, or the wonderful number, I'm on page one in the notes on the bottom. From the fact of the important question under consideration being proposed at the close of the vision by the number of secrets, 
or the wonderful number, I understand that the burden and the great object of the vision was to reveal not only the agents, but particularly the duration and the end of the appointed time of giving the host to be trodden underfoot. Go to Daniel 8.14. This is Hiram Edson, and he's referencing the wonderful numberer, uh, who is that certain saint in Daniel 8.13. And what's bold-faced is he says, when I look at Daniel 8.13, this is Hiram Edson theorizing, he says, I understand that the burden of the vision. The vision's just come to its conclusion in verse 12. And then Daniel hears this heavenly dialogue between the angels and the certain saint. So Hiram Edson saying, I, have, I understand that the great object of the vision was to reveal not only the agents, and the agents in verse 13 are these two desolating powers, paganism and papalism. Those are the agents that are going to trample down the sanctuary and the host. So Hiram Edson is saying, I understand that the, great, that the burden and great object of the vision was to reveal not only the agents, but particularly, he's saying more than paganism and papalism, but particularly the duration and the end of the appointed time. So Hiram Edson is seeing in Daniel 8.13 the emphasis on how long is this vision concerning paganism and papalism that are going to trample down the sanctuary and the host? When's it going to end? Okay, and it's going to end at the appointed time. Happy Sabbath. The notes are there. Okay, so that's a theme in his articles, one of his themes. He's looking for the appointed time in Daniel 8, but I want you to notice in that paragraph, that he's acknowledging Palmoni, the wonderful numberer. That's, his, that's how he and the pioneers understood the definition of that certain saint. A next snippet from his articles on page two of the notes. The appointed seven times of Moses' prophecy was a portion of the hidden wisdom hidden for ages. Hiram Edson's going to argue that the 2520, the seven times, is the hidden wisdom that is hidden that when it comes to light at the time of the end will produce an increase of knowledge. Okay, that's going to be his logic in this article. We're working off the notes that are titled Numerology or the Wonderful Number or Number of Secrets. I'm on page two now. I'm just pulling some thoughts from Hiram Edson's articles in 1856. And in that top paragraph in the bold face it says, But Gabriel had received a charge to make Daniel understand the vision. And Gabriel had given Daniel his pledge that he would make him know what shall be in the last end of the indignation, assuring him that at the time appointed, which we have shown to be seven times, the end should be. Hence, Gabriel, to redeem his pledge, must necessarily give a key to unlock the mystery of the appointed time and show its end. Okay, so now he's talking about a key that unlocks the mystery of the appointed time and shows the end. Okay, he's saying that this is the hidden wisdom in the scriptures. The hidden wisdom being the 2520, that when you see it, it'll mark the time of the end and there'll be an increase of knowledge. In the, in the bottom sentence of that paragraph, top paragraph on page two from Hira Benson, he says, but the key is not given. It wasn't given to him right there in chapter eight. But the key is not given, nor is the question answered either in the eighth or ninth chapters, Hence, we may expect to find them contained in the three remaining chapters, else Gabriel never fulfilled his charge, nor the redemption of his pledge. I disagree with Hiram Edson. I think that you can show that the key was given to him in Daniel 8, but Hiram Edson didn't see it. He just quoted it. He said the last end of the indignation, and you can go show there's two indignations, and you can come to understand the last end of the indignation is 1844. But... But Hiram Edson doesn't want to show it to be 1844. He wants, he wants to show it's 1798. And because of that, he's prevented from seeing that. But nevertheless, he's identifying the 2520 as this key that opens the hidden wisdom. Another portion of his um, article says, Gabriel has now led Daniel down through the prophetic chain and made him know what shall be in the last end of the indignation and shown him clearly the termination of the appointed time where the indignation should cease and has set up waymarks and high heaps. 
to serve as lighthouses, to shed a brilliant light upon the point of its termination, and from thence to the standing up or reign of Michael and the resurrection. But a very important point, the main secret of the hidden wisdom yet remained to be unfolded. The key had not yet been given to unlock and reveal the manner of time contained in the appointed seven times. By manner of time, he's talking about how do you calculate time? Year day principle. At this point, Daniel sees two heavenly ones. One of them said to be the man clothed in linen. How long shall it be till the end of these wonders? And go there, if you would. That's Daniel 12, 6. Now, Hiram Edson, unknowingly, is building his whole premise upon Daniel 12, 6, on this question. Daniel 12, 6 says, And one of the, the one said to the man clothed in linen, which is upon the waters of the river, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? The end of these wonders being the time of the end, when the, the key is turned that opens the increase of knowledge. But I want you to see that the, the verse that Hiram Edson here is pointing to is 126. It's Daniel 12, 6. Okay, um, and he recognizes it as a time, times and a half, the 1260 years that ended in 1798. Now, in terms of the what manner of time, Hiram Edson says it had to be opened up the year day principle. Okay, so in another portion of his articles, it says the burden of Daniel's anxiety in this, his diligent inquiry, is couched in the little world, word what? Peter's comment on this word will give us light on this point. The pioneers often go to Peter and address this subject right here, where they build on this. This is a pioneer understanding. See 1 Peter 1, 10 and 11. The prophets have inquired and searched diligently what or what manner of time Daniel's anxiety was now to understand the hidden wisdom or the manner of time contained in the three and a half times, which was the last half of the indignation, which would also unlock the hidden wisdom or mystery of the seven times, which was the appointed time of the whole period of the indignation. Next page. Um, Okay, I'm going, to I'm going to step over those three paragraphs, much of the same. This is Hiram Edson, and go to this last paragraph of Hiram Edson. What I'm wanting you to see is that Hiram Edson puts in place that in Daniel 8, 13, the certain saint is Palmoni, the wonderful number. He's using that as a point of reference. He's saying, he's arguing that the 2520 is the key that unlocks the increase of knowledge at the time of the end, and his anchor verse to make that point is Daniel 126, Daniel 126. But he says this key, what it unlocks is the hidden wisdom that's been hidden for ages. And when Hiram Edson is going to speak about this hidden wisdom in this final little paragraph in the middle of page three, towards the bottom, it says, the book of Daniel's vision was closed up and sealed till the time of the end. A correct understanding of many portions of the inspired vol volumes have been hidden for ages to be made manifest in their due and proper time. See Colossians 1.26. So his second witness to this hidden wisdom is once again 1.26. It's Daniel 1.26 and then Colossians 1.26. Daniel 12.6 and Colossians 1.26, and it's in reference to the wonderful number, Pamoni. Okay, um, so 1.26, you have there in, in your notes, Colossians 1.26, even the mystery which had been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. So I ga gave you a breakdown under Isaiah 7.8, okay, the, this is the structure of the 25 20 time prophecies. The prophecies given in 742 BC. The northern kingdoms taken into captivity in 723. The southern kingdom in 677, all BC. The first 2520 ends in 1798. The second ends in 1844. But because this is a chiastic structure, it extends all the way to 1863. The 19 years that comes before 723, from 742 to 723 is representing the 19 years 
after 1844 that takes you to 1863. 1863 being the year of many fulfillments in Advent history. The setting aside of these two tables and replacing them with the 1863 chart, the raising up of the Seventh-day Adventist church, the arrival of the message of the health message, the loss of, of the second of two sons that are laid to rest for the whites and fulfillment of rebuilding Jericho, on and on, 1863, pivotal waymark. And in 1856, Hiram Edson has written these seven articles, but he never finished them. So he writes them in 1856, seven articles on the seven times, and over the next seven years, Adventism rejects them. Because when you get to 1863, seven years after Hiram Edson wrote those seven articles on the seven times, they set the 2520 aside. The 1863 chart that they produce no longer lifts up the 2520, and they come out with articles against it. So, I want you to see here on next page, we don't have to read this big quote from the Great Controversy. It's a familiar quote. But it's going to tell us that Daniel 8, 14, first the first sentence under foundation and central pillar says, The scripture which above all others had been the foundation and central pillar of the Advent faith was the de declaration unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. That's the answer. The question is verse 13. How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the abomination and desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And then the answer is verse 14. You can't separate the question and answer. So Daniel 8.13 is the central pillar and foundation of Adventism, and so is Daniel 8.14. They cannot be separated. Therefore, the Bible teaches us that no other foundation can be laid except what? Then is, is laid, and that is Christ, Christ Jesus. And in verse 13, that certain saint, which is in Daniel 8, 13, and Daniel 8, 14, is Palmoni, and that's the foundation. Palmoni is the foundation and central pillar of Adventism. And notice the beginning of the paragraph in Great Controversy after that. Speaking of October 22, 1844, uh, this is, was the subject also of Hiram Edson. He was talking about an appointed time in 1798. But here, Sister White's referring to the appointed time of October 22nd, 1844. She says, But the appointed time had passed, and the Lord had not appeared. The great disappointment, October 22nd, 1844. So, now I'm, I've given some context to make some points. In the center of page 4, Daniel 8.13 in Palmoni. The Hebrew meaning is, and this is just off of Wikipedia, uh, and I'm saying that because if you get into the Hebrew, you can nail it down perfectly. But in reality, this is, this is general commonly understood. This isn't some obscure argument. The pioneers believed it. They put it in their writings. And you can go on Wikipedia and get this definition of Palmoni. It says the Hebrew meaning is the number of secrets or the wonderful numberer. Palai means secret, while Pala means wonderful, and Mena means Number, okay, palmone, palmena, okay, many, many tekel yafarsen, that's mena. In Judges 13, 17 and 18, it says, And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, What is thy name, that when thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor? And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Why ask thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? The Lord is going to go up into heaven now, and it's clearly Christ in, in the following verses. And he says, my name is secret. And you can read that saying, oh, I have a name and it's secret and you can't know it. Or you can read it, my name is secret. That is my name, okay? And the Hebrew uh, for secret is 6383, and it comes from 6381. It means remarkable, secret, wonderful, a primitive root, Proper, properly, perhaps, to separate, that is distinguished by implication to be, to be, make, great, difficult, wonderful, accomplished, hard, hidden things too high. So, what am I saying? I'm saying when Christ 
in Judges 13 says, my name is secret. He's identifying himself as the wonderful numberer. Amen. And he is Palmoni there. And of course, the, the root for that is the Hebrew word 6381. Of course, 63 is a symbol of what? It is a symbol of the 2520. What's 81 a symbol of? Midnight. So in the, in the concordance, that word secret has a numerical hidden value of the 2520 and midnight. But also, if you multiply 6 times 3 times 8 times 1, you come to 144 which is the 144,000. Right there in the word secret, which is God's name. Now, I want you to see that for this reason, Palmoni, the wonderful number, the number of secrets, as it is translated, has in the, the, an element of that name, the pali part of it, um, the secret part of it. It has... The, the stamp of the 144,000. And I'm arguing that Daniel 8.13 is identifying Palmoni, but that Matthew 16.18 is, is giving a second witness to Palmoni, or maybe a third, if you want to include Daniel 5.25 as a second witness. Those are the three I'm going to look at upon the testimony of two or three a thing is established. So Daniel 5.25, what's Daniel 5.25? Well, I have for you in your notes, verses 25 through 28. But it says, And this is the writing that was written, many, many tekel you farsen. This is the interpretation of the thing, many, God hath numbered. Palmoni, the moni part of Palmoni is many. Okay, so the Palmoni's name is directly connected with the handwriting on the wall. Pal is the secret. Many is the number. And that's just how Daniel defines it for Belshazzar. He says, many, God hath numbered thy kingdom. Okay, do you, so you see the connection? Everyone see the connection there? And that's in Daniel 5.25. So if you turn the page to Daniel 5.25, 525 plus 252 is 777. Okay, so if you take 525, if you take, if you go from November 9th, 2019 to December 25th, 2021, you have 777 days. But if you go 252 days to here, you get to July 18, 2020, leaving 525 days. But we've identified already that this history is the history of Donald Trump. Donald Trump has so many 777s upon his <laughs> on his history, that this is the history of Trump, the last president of the United States. But this history at this level is broken up in these three way marks. And of course, November 9th was a Sabbath. July 18th will be a Sabbath. And December 25th will be a Sabbath. And these three dates occurring as Sabbath has never happened before in human history. These three dates happen every year, okay, for 6,000 years. But the first time that these three dates line up as Sabbath, 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 is right here on this line. So not only do you have 777 days from this date to this date, but you have a seventh-day Sabbath, seventh-day Sabbath, seventh-day Sabbath. And what I'm saying is, in Daniel 5.25, when Belshazzar sees the handwriting on the wall, the many, many tekel yefarsin, that that is connecting us to Daniel 8.13, the wonderful numberer. You follow me? And that this 
525 is this number here. And what I'm saying is if you invert it, I don't know if I'm using the right word, but if you invert 525, it's 252. That, that's what I'm defining invert is. Changing 525 using the same numbers and just flipping around to 252. You follow me? That's in your notes. Um, but also if you, mirror, if you mirror this 525, and I'm not sure that I'm saying this correctly either, but if you mirror it upside down, okay, if this is the mirror, then this 5 flips over and becomes a 2, and this 2 flips over and becomes a 5, and this 5 flips over and becomes a 2. You, f you know what I mean by mirroring it upside down now, right? So there's, a, there's some kind of mathematical relationship with these two numbers here that they're not coincidental or accidental. So Daniel 5.25 is speaking to this mathematical phenomenon, and I'm saying that Pali, the, the part of Palmoni that is secret, as Daniel recently shared from Deuteronomy 29.29, says, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of His law. If you do all the words of his law, then you are in a covenant relationship with him, right? That's how you keep the covenant, is you're obedient to his law. So in Psalm 25, 14, it says, The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Okay, so if the secret things are revealed to you, they're revealed to you from the Lord, and when he does that and you accept them, then you're in a covenant relationship with him. And I'm saying the symbol of the covenant relationship among other things, is the 144,000, which you can find in the Hebrew letter of secret, Hebrew 6381. But I'm also saying that the third witness or the second witness, depending on what order that you want to put it is, in is, is, is Matthew 16, 18, where we have discussed that in that verse, you have so many things going on. You have uh, the, the gold, fibia, Fibonacci's golden ratio in that verse. The relationship of the Fibonacci sequence to the golden ratio is this. The ratio of each successive pair of numbers in the sequence approximates phi. Phi being 1.6. And the golden ratio is what? Or the, the Fibonacci's ratio is this. 0 plus 1 equals 1, 1 plus 1 equals 2, 1 plus 2 equals 3, 2 plus 3 equals 5, 3 plus 5 equals 8, 5 plus 8 equals 13. That's Daniel 8, 13, and it goes on. It goes to 21, midnight, it goes to 34, close of probation, and it goes on. But as this ratio between each two numbers goes on, phi defines the ratio to each other, it's 1.6, 1.6, 1.618 is phi. That's Matthew 16, 18. The Fibonacci, Fibonacci sequence is a series where the next term is the sum of the two previous terms. I've already went over that. Phi is the 21st letter in the Greek alphabet 21, being a symbol of midnight. And in the place where we find Matthew 16, 18, where we find this reference, you have it in your notes, it says, And I say unto you, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I want you to see, this is what you have to see. Peter, we know that P is the 16th letter in the English alphabet, E is the 5th, T is the 20th, E is the 5th, R is the 18th, and when you multiply those, they come to 144,000. So in this verse, Matthew 16, 18, Peter's marking the 144,000, the same way Palmoni, with the part of his name that is secret, in Daniel 8, 13, is marking the 144,000, the same way, they're connected. But I want you to see that Daniel 8, 13 is talking about 
two powers, paganism and papalism, that are going to trample down what? God's temple and his people. So Daniel 8.13 is about the restoration of God's temple. And Matthew 16.18 is about a struggle between the gates of hell, that's paganism and papalism, and God's church. They are parallel passages. You follow me? So they're, they're not just connected randomly. And what's the third witness that we've already looked at? Daniel 5.25. Okay, Daniel 5.25 is the handwriting on the walls, the judgment against Belshazzar. Where did he fill the cup of his iniquity? Belshazzar in that story. When he brought the sacred vessels of the temple in, that was the end of the road. Daniel 8.13 is about God's church. Daniel 5 is about God's church. Matthew 16.18 is about God's church. There are three parallel passages. They all have the wonderful numbering going on in them. And the number that does these wonderful numbers is none other than Palmoni. It is Christ. So in the bottom of page 5, another thought on the temple. It says, Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? And that's John 2.20. Okay. <laughs> 2.20 was fulfilled on October 22nd, 1844, after 46 years from 1798 to 1844. In the time of Christ, it was Herod's remodeling that took 46 years to remodel that temple. And Jesus says, destroy this temple, which is once again a reference to Daniel 8.13, Daniel 5.25, and Matthew 16.18. Destroy this temple, and I'll raise it up in three days. So the three is 46. And the 2.20 is pointing to the temple. Okay. So in Malachi 3, 1 through 4, it says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord who you, whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord. And I won't read the rest. When did the Lord come to his temple? On October 22nd, 1844, he suddenly came to his temple and entered into covenant with Millerite Adventism. And... In the next page, you can see Sister White confirming this for you if you're not familiar with it. And she says four, at least four prophecies happened on October 22, 1844. Malachi 3, Daniel 7, 13, Daniel 8, 14, and Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins. She says they're the same event. But she says this coming suddenly to his temple will be repeated in our day and age. You have that in Great Controversy 427. Um, notice the last paragraph of those two paragraphs. Well, notice the first sentence. says, The prophet, who shall abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Malachi 3. That was fulfilled on October 22nd. She's quoting it here. And then in the next paragraph, she says, When this work shall have been accomplished, the followers of Christ will be ready for his appearing. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant. So it happens again. He came suddenly to his temple on October 22, 1844. He comes suddenly to his temple in our history. And when he came to the temple on October 22, 1844, there had been 46 years where the Millerite Temple was being built from 1798 to 1844, just as it was 46 years for Herod's remodeling, just as it was 46 days for Moses to receive the instruction on the Temple on the Mount. Just as in our human body temple, we have 46 chromosomes, 23 female, 23 male. Okay, so the 46 is a symbol of the Temple, and it gets repeated in our day and age. And when it does, the 220 will be fulfilled. And that 46 years is also three days. Okay. Um, and to make sure you understand it gets built again, read Zechariah 6, 12 through 15. 